Screen Heroes. I am Ray, and I am joined by my two very masculine and handsome hosts, Ooh. Ryan Hello. and Derek. Yo! How are you guys tonight? Masculine, masculine and handsome. <laughs> we did yes. not plan that. Yes, you are. We've done this a couple of yeah, times. Yeah, once or I loved it. I want that to be my new ringtone. <laughs> masculine and handsome yeah. in, in like surround sound. Yeah, it the was fact, beautiful. It was harmonized. The and... fact that we did it together like that reminded me of airplane. You know, it's an entirely different kind of flying all together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well you were really hoping that we were going to do I was. it. I was. I was not going to do it. No, I wasn't nope, either. It was lightning in a bottle. You don't get it again. Yeah, you guys let me down. That's fine. I forgive you. All right. Well, <laughs> while Derek mopes, I'm going to kind of tell you what's going on. So tonight we are reviewing Venom. If you haven't checked out Venom yet, then maybe you want to just hang out for the news portion Put us on pause. Go see the movie right now. There's still showings on Tuesday nights. And then come back and view the rest of it. Don't forget, though, if you don't want spoilers, you could check out our Venom quick movie take. Absolutely. We did a quick video just giving you our fast and easy and cheap reviews. Super you know, cheap. just like all of us. Yeah. Fast, easy, and cheap. It's not far off. Fantastic. So that's available on our YouTube channel. You can find the link at heroespodcasts.com. Absolutely. And it's also posted all over our social media. So if that's, that's just what you follow and you don't actually go to real websites anymore, that's fine too. So in the news, first off, the box office numbers. Venom took the the number one position with $80 million. Stars Born uh, with 41, which, you know, more than tripled its budget. And Smallfoot is still holding strong. Apparently, Channing Tatum as a Yeti is something people wanted. So, I mean, I wasn't asking for it, but I'm sure there's an audience out there. So, that's cool. I mean, it was the only, like, legitimate kids movie yeah. that came out this weekend. So, that's not, like, super shocking. But So, let's address this first. Uh, Venom is at 31% on Rotten Tomatoes by critics. 89% by audience. Now, uh, depending on how we do this, since they don't merge their scores like the other aggregate sites, we all took a bet last week on what Venom was going to get. And I said 29%. Ryan said 38%. Derek said 50%. I said 50 to 60. You yeah, don't Derek has to take a range for some reason. 10%. Break the rules. We're going with five. your lower. We're going to do 55. Yeah, we're going with your lower. Five. Five. Now, if we just go by Rotten Tomatoes critics, then I win. If we go by a combination of the two, then I, I win. Derek is the winner. Woo! My average, if you take the average, it's 59.5%. Yes. So. so. What did you pick? 50. And I that's mean, much closer to both of you. If you're going by price and right, price is right rules where <laughs> you can't go over. I didn't go over. Or they go over. Well, whatever. We're Either going way, by reverse I price is right rules. It's true. Whatever. I don't know which, what no. version so, you need to go with here. Ryan, what do you want to do? What do I want to do? Yeah, like if. For Derek? Nothing. Well, <laughs> It's hurtful. Well, I was supposed to make baked goods for the I winner for next week. The, should I yeah. make baked goods that I pick out for myself and then you guys just enjoy them next week? Yeah, I think that's okay. the best plan. But I was the closest. If only we, if we take only the aggregate. Only if we combine. I was the closest to the critic score. But I was the closest to the audience score and the average score. I got two out of the three possible scores. All right. Vote on which host <laughs> from the HPN you would like to have replaced Derek starting next week. I'll take the night off. It's fine. <laughs> um, let's move on. Other news. New York Comic Con was this weekend, and a lot of really cool TV show trailers dropped. Yep. New Daredevil trailer was probably my favorite. Yes. It was uh, really good. It was awesome. Good. It basically confirmed that Bullseye is the villain and that he's mm -hmm. dressing up as... It's implied that he's dressing up as Daredevil. I don't think they, they don't show him taking the mask off or no. anything, but... You it's wouldn't want to do like, that in the trailer. Also, one of the actors went up and drew a... Uh, I think Charlie Cox drew the bullseye symbol on the other actor's forehead during the panel. <laughs> That's funny. So, yeah, that was good stuff. I did not know that. That's funny. Yeah, yeah but the trailer was great. So yeah. I'm very excited for that show. It comes out in, what, two weeks? Absolutely, like yeah, really the 19th, soon. 19th, right? Is mm -hmm. it? October 19th? I yeah, pretty soon. Yeah. really soon. Um, two of the shows I'm looking forward to, American Gods is finally coming back, Woo! which I'm very happy about. I loved the first season. I thought it was really solid, whimsical, scary. Like, it was everything I wanted it to be. 
but there was a lot of issues right after season one wrapped. So I didn't think it was going to get back on track. They released a casting bit here and there like once every, I don't know, three months. So I just assumed it was gone. I assumed it was a dead project trying to tread water. But Especially it's not. Especially when Gillian Anderson left. Yeah, that was not a good sign. So they figured it out. They're replacing her very intelligently. And I can really appreciate that. But Good Omens also dropped their trailer. And it just looked fun as hell. I'm so excited. It really pumped me up. Yeah, they both look good. I, I definitely need to rewatch season one of American Gods because, I mean, by the time this one comes out, it will have been like two years. Absolutely. Um, as amazing as it was, I don't quite remember the details of where we left off. So, right. I get that. Um, I'll want to rewatch that. But it still looked good. Definitely excited that it's actually happening. So, uh, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, also on uh, Netflix, had a new trailer. And this looks like kind of what Buffy was back in the 90s, a kitschy horror show and should be a lot of fun. And then lastly, the new... Star Trek! Star the Trek. new Star Trek! Yeah, they Star... showed Spock! They did. Star Trek Discovery dropped a new trailer uh, for season two, which now has an official release date, um, which is January 17th. Uh, we talk all about it on this uh, week's episode of Red Shirts and Runabouts. It comes out Friday, episode 45. So we won't go into huge no. detail, but it it was a good trailer. Like, yeah, all of these were really good trailers this week. They cut them really well. Yeah, it was really fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. There was a lot, a lot of little Easter eggs in that trailer for all the Trekkies out there. But, yeah, we mm -hmm. talked about it on Red Shirts and Runabouts. So. All right, next up. So the 13th Doctor, played by Jodie Whittaker. Her first episode debuted this weekend. Eight million international viewers. It's one of the highest uh, debuts for a new Doctor, for any of the Doctor shows. So it was, you know, really cool to see that. Mattel dropped their uh, new Barbie for the Doctor. So that's really neat, too. A lot of positive reviews on it as well i think 13 is going to have a really good run yeah early reactions have been very positive i haven't watched it yet uh, myself but everyone i know who's watched it has been really happy with it mm -hmm. and these are people who've you know grown up with doctor who and watched it their entire lives and um, if they're happy with it that's a good sign writers former directors things like that you know, I'm not a Doctor Who fan, but I've seen the same feedback that you guys have. Facebook friends posting, and everybody seems to like it. So, yeah, it's hopefully going to be a good season for everybody. Um, so, in some sad news, Scott Wilson, who is, as of now, best known for Herschel from The Walking Dead, he does have more than 50 acting credits to his name, so go check out his IMDb. But he passed away this weekend at the age of 76 was really sad i know you and i have watched walking mm -hmm. dead and he was a good he was part probably of the only character that was better than his comic book counterpart in the show absolutely so. that is high praise though they kept yeah. him around a lot longer because he was more compelling mm -hmm. as well yeah yeah and he's been to our area for conventions a couple times and you know, yeah had a i lot got of to meet him at here, crypticon so. that one year we went yeah the he's a good guy we yeah the only year we went <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> accurate Shazam Gate 2018. Ryan, over to you. Nothing, guys. Dry week for Shazam Gate. Movie's mm. still coming out. Movie's still coming out. <laughs> you know, very excited. Uh, he wants to fight The Rock. You guys talked about that last week, but other than that. I want him to fight The Rock. I want to see that on screen battle so bad. I want it to take 30 to 45 minutes. Yeah, like... They could literally just call it. Zachary Levi versus The Rock, yeah, and have them wear their costumes, and they don't even have to act in character. Well, so, Zachary Levi is always in character. I guess. What would you rather see, Zachary Levi fight The Rock or Shazam fight Black Adam? I mean, can I get why we have to pick one? <laughs> I'm just a little from I'm column just A, a little from column B. <laughs> so, I have to ask you guys, just brief tangent. Do you think The Rock is a, a skyscraper? Was a huge disappointment. Baywatch the, was a huge disappointment. At the box box office this year. Um, I didn't see either film, so I don't know if story-wise and movie-wise they were a disappointment. But do you think The Rock is kind of overstaying his welcome? They tend to add him into... It. No? no. I don't think he's overstaying his welcome. I think he's just picked a few bad movies. And That's fair. It, he does so many films every year now that it's it's not going to be all good stuff. The Jumanji made a 
fortune at the box office. It was a December release, but most of its money was made in 2018. I, I um, only bring this up because recent critics have called him the Rockbuster for Blockbuster, as well as Blockbuster Viagra. So those are terms that I, I feel like <laughs> you're pushing your bubble if you're getting those terms, but I don't know. I could be completely off about this. I mean, it's been a long time since we've had a single actor who had that type of like draw for summer Blockbuster type stuff because we don't really have that type of movie scheduling system anymore. Um, but his movies are still pretty successful. Rampage made a good amount of money too. It did. It made um, a lot of money. And it wasn't half bad. Like it was fun to sit and watch. It was exactly what you expect it to be. And that's fine. Like, I mean, the problem is you look at a movie like Skyscraper and you're talking, if you're talking to me, a guy who just loves 80s action flicks and Die Hard is one of my favorite movies and you watch the Skyscraper trailer and you're like, that looks bad. You know, I'm not going to go see it just because The Rock is in it. Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't go see any movie, most any movie, be, just because of an actor. There's yeah. obviously going to be a few exceptions. But, yeah, I mean, I like The Rock. And if he's in a movie that I'm mildly interested in, that might push my interest level a little bit more. Right. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think he's overstayed his welcome. I think he'll, he'll like, sink back a little bit, maybe do a few less movies that are hopefully more successful, Do a little, be a little pickier with his roles. Yeah. But I mean, Rampage is a good example. If it had been a non-A-list, no-name actor as the lead in Rampage, mm -hmm. I probably would have just said, eh, it's going to be a terrible B-monster movie. But because it was The Rock, it's like, well, giant monsters destroying stuff and The Rock? Okay, I'll go see that. Right? Yeah. So, he still, right. he still draws people. Perfect. So, moving on. Today, we got to see our first look at Ruby Rose as Batwoman for the CW crossover Elseworlds, which will... Happen uh, sometime in December. I don't have the exact date off the top of my head, but that's always ninth when they do the ninth is when the crossover begins. Okay. Yeah, it's so so. what four four episodes or three episodes. It's three like this year. Uh, Legends of Tomorrow is not participating right. in so. the crossover for whatever reason. Too bad they're not doing so. Black Lightning, considering it is Elseworlds. They still don't want to cross over those two shows. Uh, that that show with the other the others. They are bringing Superman in for every episode. Yeah. Are they really? Yeah. For the crossover. All right. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather it be Martian Manhunter per personally. But, yeah, but he'll uh, probably get left out again. He just uh, conveniently can't be there for anything. His but, CGI costs so much compared to everybody. But like, it, like, it's not even a, like a lot of it is practical now. They they did his work practical too. It's the transformation is CGI, right? But just have him be in his in his alien form from the beginning of the episode. Yeah, just have him do it off screen. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. There you go. What do you guys think of the costume? I love it. I think it's very comic accurate. I mean, I'm yeah. not a big comic reader, but I've seen a lot of art, and she always... I think that the cowl might be a little more aggressive than what I anticipated it being, but in, in the comics, she's had a very, she's a very aggressive personality, and the cowl kind of suits that. Yeah, that um, woman's very aggressive. It, is, it isn't like a mask. Like, I feel like in the comics, it's more of a mask, whereas she does. this one's more of a cowl that goes back behind the back of her head. I think it has, like, an exposed top, too, so like the Wally hair West. can hang out. Yeah. Exactly. I think that makes more sense from a practical perspective, For sure. though. Right? It's less likely to get knocked off, you know? I don't disagree. Like I just, in the comic books, it yeah. seems like it's mostly a mask. I don't know. Ollie's mask never comes off. Ollie's hood never falls back, true, but Flash's cowl gets torn off all the time. Yeah, and he can just go, like, and then it's off. And if you've right. ever worn a cowl, that's not how it works. I know, I know. It's it's ridiculous. You have to lube up your head. I, sometimes, depending yeah. on the cowl. I think her this this vision of it is incredibly comic accurate, but also realistically practical. I really right? liked it. My favorite part was the cape, because it had this ombre look from black to red. And I've never seen a cosplayer do that. I've never seen the comic books do it. So it was its own new touch. There's a lot of people complaining about the, the length of the cape, right? That sounds like such a petty thing, but you know how people are. they got to find something to critique. And, and yeah. it does seem a little short, but I mean, she doesn't really in the comic books have a Batman-length cape most no. of the time. So I don't think it's that big of a deal. I like her bracers being as, uh, like, kind of simple mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as they were. The only thing I wish is that her gloves and bracers were of the same red as everything else. I feel like that would have made it pop a little bit her more so with the boots. different from the design on the chest, too. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it, it's I, I, overall, I'm very happy with it. I, think I am, too. It's a really too. cool costume, and I'm hoping some cosplayers do it because it, it looks great. really neat. I want to see it. I like that they definitely steered right into the red hair. 
Yeah. Like, it's not kind of red. No, it looks it very much, you can tell it's a wig, and I hope they lean into that, because yeah. in the comic books, it's obviously a wig, too, and they don't try and hide that, you know? So, yeah, making it look fake it's is fine with part me. Part of the disguise. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So, it's cool that she has her own bat signal up in the sky in the background. Mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of neat. Um, so, definitely looking forward to seeing her character. So, lastly, James Gunn is 100% writing Suicide Squad 2. They confirmed that today. And uh, they're still in talks, but he may be directing Suicide Squad 2. Thoughts? I think it's hilarious. Right. I mean, like, it's just so funny, that this kind of back and forth. And there's been stuff that's gone the other way, too. But, of course, this one's kind of high profile. But, I mean, yeah, he's a guy who made a very successful ensemble film with characters nobody really cared about. Well, Suicide Squad wasn't that well received. Now he gets to do it again. I think it, uh, it's kind of funny because the Marvel fans are like, oh, the Warner Brothers picking up our scraps again. DC Comics picking up the Marvel scraps again like they did with Joss Whedon. Um, and then the DC fans are like, this is cool because he did a great, <laughs> really cool movie for Marvel. So I feel like yeah, there's a lot of animosity going one way, not the way I would have anticipated. And then the other way is really kind of excited. So Batista's sticking his foot in his mouth. He's saying that he wants to join Suicide Na- Squad. Yeah, he, he tweet- like he I just okay wants to say dust at this point. Like he's not coming back. You know what? I like him as an actor. I like that he stands by his principles, whether I agree with them or not. And uh, you know, if they want to bring him in for Suicide Squad. We need a new Killer Croc, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, do King we? Shark. No. Or, uh, I, I there you I, go. King Shark would be. King our, Shark. <laughs> our, King Shark. Or, so I thought our Killer Croc was actually one of the better parts. Of yeah, the movie, I mean, he but, was well done. He was. He yeah. won a, uh, an Oscar for it. So. <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, Oscar. Oscar winning Suicide Squad. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I mean, the, the James Gunn thing is kind of funny because I think it's the Marvel, the same Marvel fans who are trying to sign petitions to get Disney to go back on their decision are probably the same people who are really mad and making fun of the DC fan, DC for picking up their scraps because they're pissed that they don't have James Gunn anymore. I mean, I'm right? kind of pissed about it. It sucks. I, I was totally for James Gunn reaping the consequences until it was pointed out to me that he has already apologized for it. You know, two years after it happened, as well as the fact that Disney knew about it. James Gunn was very upfront and said, hey, here are my skeletons. Here's what I'm doing. So now Disney just looks like a bunch of assholes. It's totally disingenuous from Disney's part. It was a CYA thing when they felt like they were getting bullied online by a bunch of white supremacists anyway. So the whole thing is is silly. And I'm glad to see that James Gunn's still going to get work over it because, you know. He deserves it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not happy with what he, the joke, the quote jokes that he made back then. But yeah, he did apologize for him long before he became the A-list director that everybody now knows. Mm-hmm. And people were aware of them. Then. And the company that he was working for at the time was well known for edgy and, you know, kind of terrible humor in their movies. So I don't think it's, I mean, I don't agree with the jokes, obviously, yeah. but I think that it was kind of almost expected of the company that he was keeping at the time. The 2000s were filled with really terrible jokes. I remember sitting at lunch hearing very similar jokes to this, and I remember giggling because I was a dumbass. And the whole point is growing up and realizing that that stuff's wrong. And, you know, you apologize to people that it may have offended at the time, and you apologize for your actions and you move on. And he did that. That's exactly like we're supposed to be able to grow and move on. We're not supposed to be infallible our entire lives. So, yeah. So he's writing Suicide Squad 2. Right. And it'll, it should be a lot of fun. I hope Killer Frost is introduced because she's in a lot of Suicide Squad stuff. Hopefully especially Tana as has lately. more than one line. Or, I just hope she's gone. Like move her over to Birds of Prey because they'll do something be way better with her. There are some rumors that they may. this may not be so much a sequel as much as just kind of a soft reboot of Suicide Squad and just kind of retool a the lot of it. The squad is always different because there are new prisoners in all the prisons. Black Even an arrow. Game. Every time they've had the Suicide Squad on there, there might be a couple people that carry over, but it's mm-hmm. it's a lot of new people every time. Mm-hmm. Seems like so. I mean that they did a good job on the TV show with yeah. it, and I wish that that would translate to the movies. I of course, agree. you know, Deadshot's going to be in it. Harley's probably still going to be right. in it. Those two um, are good. Yeah, yeah, if Margot Robbie and Will Smith want to be in your movie, well, I think honestly a lot of the characters were pretty. All of the acting, I didn't have any ish- issues with any of the characters. It was all of the writing and the and, yeah. you know, Other than Enchantress, the whole dance thing was a little weird. Jai but. Courtney was surprisingly amazing as Boomerang. Like he was really good. I liked him as a villain. I want to see him come back at 
the very least. In Diablo, I thought it was, was well acted, even yeah. if you didn't really like the character. I mean, I didn't like uh, Captain Exposition, whatever his name was. No, Rick Flag was Rick awful. Flag. Rick Flag. I, okay. yeah, I hope they great. remove Rick Flag. I hope they remove Enchantress from this because they didn't do those characters right. I hope Katana gets repurposed somewhere else because she's she's a hero. Like, what is she even doing there? She that was makes, protecting the good guy, which was stupid. It was a dumb. I agree. Dumb part. They just wanted another woman because they looked bad. So, you know, whatever you want to do with everybody else, but... Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. So, before we go, we're going to play a little game. Ooh. Um, every week I ask you guys a question starting a few weeks ago. So, you know, long-standing tradition. <laughs> this week we're going to do a play on um, Kill Mary Bang. And instead, because I don't like objectifying women all that much. So it's going to be men. It's for you two. No, for you two only. Oh, I'm not going to do this. Oh, this bait, huh? <laughs> Convenient. Out of the Gotham City Sirens, who's your best friend? Who's your partner in crime? Who's your wifey? That's and the, the question. And the Gotham City Sirens are Poison Ivy, Harley Quinn, and, and Catwoman? Yes. Okay. Can I get so, a pen, Derek? Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll get you a pen, Ryan. I'll get you a pen. So, we're going to take a quick break for advertisements because we're sellouts. No, don't frame it like that. <laughs> we are sellouts. We're so plugging other shows. We're plugging on our other own shows network. on the network. These aren't like. It's quick. We'll be right back. We are enjoy getting paid by the other shows. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'm paying myself for the other shows. Right. That makes sense. Um, real quick, though, for anybody who watched last week when we had Eric on and we ranked the Pixar movies. You might have noticed that we never answered the question Ray posed to us in that Oops. episode because we forgot. So next time Eric's on, we promise we will answer that question. So you'll just have I'm to... I'm saving it. I think it's unfair to not include him because he's probably just, you know, chomping at the bit to answer yeah, my one every name night. question. Every night, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to take a short break. We will be right back, everybody. Do you like Star Trek? Because over at Red Shirts and Runabouts, part of the Heroes Podcast Network, we absolutely love Star Trek. Join us every week with me, one of your regular hosts, Gregory Bosco, as we talk about your favorite characters, your favorite movies, your favorite episodes. We even respond to some of your comments on Twitter and Facebook, at least those that are appropriate for us to talk about online. Every Friday, Red Shirts and Runabouts. See you next week. Welcome back, everyone. So, now that we are to the meat of our segment, we are going to be reviewing Venom. Talking about uh, our favorite parts, our non-favorite parts, what we thought of the overall film. So, this is your spoiler warning. We will be talking about the entire film. So, start to finish, post-credits, credits, whatever. We're going to talk about it. Uh, like we said, it dominated the box office. Uh, Derek believes it's the highest October box office that's ever Opening happened. weekend, yeah. I think it had the highest October opening weekend ever. Um, which is cool. It had a, uh, the highest uh, pre Thursday preview um, of any October movie ever, and it rivaled some really big movies. Uh, so it made a, a ten million uh, Thursday night for its first night. And to put that in Similar perspective, to Deadpool and Wonder Woman, you said, uh, and Captain America: The Winter Soldier. Uh, Wonder, That's Wonder Woman good. was like the highest at like eleven. Uh, Winter Soldier was I think ten point six or something like that. So like oh. it was in pretty good company for a preview night, which was a little surprising since a lot of our theaters locally were fairly available if you wanted to see it um but yeah it had a very very good opening weekend financially it yeah. broke all expectations uh, made over 200 million internationally 205 yeah that's great good for the movie so we can pretty much guarantee with those numbers a sequel or a spinoff or something connecting it will be uh down the po pipeline possibly 2020 yeah um and we already know who's gonna be in it Yep. We yep. Gonna that. that we'll, we'll we good. Gone yeah. We're going to talk yet. about that. I did. I did. Oh, did I did do the spoiler this is why recording. I don't pay attention at all. <laughs> it's, it's Woody Harrelson. <laughs> good job. <laughs> playing just himself. Just Woody Harrelson. <laughs> I'm fine with it. He's actually playing his character from Cheers. Woody. Oh, I was thinking he was going to be playing his character from Kingpin. Perfect. I yeah. love it. With one hand. I love it. Okay. <laughs> anyway. So, let's talk about the film. What did you guys like? What did you not like? I actually really enjoyed myself watching this movie, so really? I'm probably going to be less harsh on it than the That's average person. Fair. Which means it's going to be arguing with me the whole time. Um, no, I'm not arguing. Look, it is a silly freaking movie. It, it is. Was. 
I understand now when critics were saying that it feels like it doesn't belong in this decade. I get it. It feels like the first Spider-Man. You know, it feels old as far as the way the storytelling goes and the jokes. It, it reminded me of the first Ghost Rider a lot. Sure. A lot. I was actually going to say it felt... It, like, I read some of the reviews of people saying that it felt like an early 2000s movie. I was like, how could it feel like an early 2000s movie? But yeah, Ghost Rider specifically, and mm-hmm. I don't didn't get as much of the first uh, Spider-Man movie. Just a little as, cheesy, did, but, but like, not in like the epically amazing way like Spider-Man Two was. I, I got more of like Fantastic Four uh, and yeah, see, Ghost I don't think it was Rider. That bad. I definitely um, don't think it was Fantastic Four bad. Okay. The first Fantastic Four wasn't that bad. Right. The second one uh, with Silver Surfer. Silver Surfer was the only good part. There was a really obnoxious dance scene. And Jessica Alba was even more CGI'd to look like a Aryan woman instead of the beautiful Hispanic woman she is. So that was off-putting. But I mean, the, Silver Surfer was fantastic. Doug Jones. Doug Jones, yeah. The first Fantastic Four was bad enough that I didn't see the sequel. Oh. Whereas this movie, I would go see a sequel. So that in my head, that just means I enjoyed this one more. All right. Sure. Well, I mean, I'm, I made no secret that I like Ghost Rider. And yeah. I like Fantastic Four. And I and I did enjoy this movie. It was I would never say it was a good movie though. I didn't say it was good. I said I really enjoyed myself. And I didn't Completely say I different. really enjoyed myself. I, I enjoyed the, enjoyed it some, but it, I mean there was I don't think the things I laughed at were necessarily supposed to be the things that were laughed at. That's what I think. I caught myself laughing at moments and nobody else in the theater were laughing, and I was like, oh. Oh, I'm the asshole. Okay, that's fair. But I don't think you are. I think that the that it's <laughs> tough to tell can, what can how they're framing example? it. I can't. Honestly, I'm it so wasn't sorry. memorable enough. Really, a lot. Of, I okay. think it was some of the dialogue between Eddie and Venom was like it was so bad that I was that that made it funny to me. See, I I, I thought it was like the way that came off definitely felt like it was supposed to be. Venom some of it funny. did. I mean, I I I felt like it was okay. all supposed to be funny. So. I didn't know that. Eddie did, or Tom Hardy and Riz Ahmed did the voices for the Eddie Brock and Riot. I was the symbiote. Or, yeah, the symbiote. Uh, I had no clue that they were doing the voices for that. I and that made me love it even more. The fact that they did all the voices. I know it's heavily digitally edited. Yeah, I watched know. a video from the director. He said that Tom Hardy would actually right at the very beginning of the day record all his lines as Venom and as Eddie Brock. And they they would go through real quick and cut out all the Eddie Brock pieces and put an earpiece in him, so and play back the scenes he had just acted out, so that he was actually talking to Venom oh, in his ear. That's um, cool. So, that's that's smart. Actually, yeah. that's pretty. And cool. I think it worked. I think that that was the biggest part that worked for the of the movie for me was the the relationship between Eddie and Venom. Mm-hmm. Um, although it was kind of a weird character shift. I don't know. Maybe it was just me that like Eddie in the beginning was like. He's a badass reporter that's like going and not taking shit from anybody, and he's uh, you know pushing to get the story, and he won't listen to his editor because that's the kind of badass guy he is. And then he <laughs> turns into this whining, whimpering like you know. And I get it; you have something going on with you that makes you a little scared, but it doesn't like completely one eighty your entire personality. I think that was a, a bad trend for the film because that's not the only flip. No. Venom flips. At the yeah. end of the movie, and just inexplicably, just, now he wants like, to save humanity. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. no explanation for that at yeah. all. And like, I get that they had to do that, but you have to give me some type of reason to believe. Which makes me feel like maybe some of it is hidden in that 30, 40 minutes of film that was cut. And honestly, if I could, I would have cut that restaurant scene so much. That was awkward and ho- like where he's oh. just eating all the random things and he, and he gets in the, in the lobster yeah. tank like i was laughing throughout most of that and cringing through most of it because it was just it was poor writing it was poor editing it was not great acting from anyone involved and just awkward so i really wanted that to go away and bring back the stuff that was cut i'm hoping we get like a venom cut later with all of that restored speaking of the cut and the editing when we got the first trailer, it felt like it was going to be a horror movie. Yes, and a lot did. of the rumors were that it was going to be a horror movie. But it didn't get that rated R. Otherwise, we would R. have seen more of the gore from him eating people. But would people. that have made it a horror movie? I mean, the tone really felt like it was going to be a horror That it first did. trailer really set it up as a horror movie. The movie is not a horror no. movie. I don't care how many violent scenes they cut from the movie. There's no plot here that's horror. 
Right. It's just not. And whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, I, I guess that's up to the, the viewer, right? If you wanted a horror movie or not. But, I mean, even if that 30 to 40 minutes is all R-rated content, let's just pretend for a minute it had a half an hour of R-rated content in it, that would not have changed it to a horror movie. Yeah. No. And I don't even know that that would have necessarily made it a good, a, a better movie. I think that the R rating, sure, we could have seen like, and we wouldn't have seen like a silhouette body thrown away with no blood, right? right. We would have seen a, a bunch of blood and stuff. But I don't think that would have improved the movie at all. It still would have been a very mediocre, you know, it, it would have been what it is right. still. I mean, so the audience, audiences have, have obviously liked it more than the critics have. And I don't think that having it be super violent would have won over any critics. Right. Right? I don't think there's any... I don't remember seeing any critic reviews that said, well, if it was only more bloody. Right. Right? That would have made it all better. <laughs> um, so I, I th- maintain that the majority of critics are still old school critics looking for the Oscar bait for most of their stuff. You look at A Star is Born and it's got really high... Uh, ratings on Rotten Tomatoes by the audience and the critics. But when you look at films like Venom, the disconnect is so large between critics and audience. And that's not the first time we've seen this this time around. Like Ant-Man and Wasp had a huge disconnect too. I feel like part of it is that, because I've seen a lot of memes about this this last week about Venom, is that people want the critics to be wrong. Right, and so they see a movie that looks really cool in the trailers, and they see it getting a thirty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and they're like, "This movie was totally adequate." But in their mind, because they expect it to be so bad, it, it seems great, and so they're going on there and giving it this high rating because they want to offset the critics. And I've seen a bunch of memes shared this week about how literally everyone that saw the movie like trying to keep the critics away from the movie because the yeah, critics literally that. aren't everyone that saw the movie. I don't understand how that works, but uh, I mean. I don't know. I think I think we wanted critics to be wrong on like Batman v Superman, right? Yes. Because we really wanted that to be a good movie. And we just want to like things. Right, absolutely. But I mean, I don't think there I think that a lot of this is just like people really mm. giving it too much credit because the critics said it was so bad. If you're a hardcore Venom fan, and you went into this, and you can step away saying it's an objectively good movie. I say you're blinded. Yeah. If you walked into this and you enjoyed yourself because you felt like the characters did the comic book some justice, or because what you saw on screen was a lot of fun for you, then I completely believe you. And that's just fine. And I don't think that a lot of the critics, that the majority of critics, have that same connection as Venom fans. I think the the big problem here is that we use Rotten Tomatoes as an end all be all. Right. And everybody rot- does. It's rotten, ridiculous. But it's a yes no r- review, right? Rotten Tomatoes is was it good or bad? And that creates this dichotomy of we see a movie that's sitting in the 20 percentiles, we're like, well there's no way it's that bad of a movie, right? Cuz it probably deserves to be at like 50%. Mm-hmm. And if we saw it at 50%, we'd be like, okay, so it's going to be a mediocre flick. That's why I prefer IMDb. You right. get literally 10 stars. You can do half stars, too. And, you know, I would have given this, like, a 6.5 or 7 on the IMDb. And it's sitting at 7.1. And that makes sense. That's what we're saying. So that's lower than Rotten Tomatoes' audience score. Obviously higher than the critic score, right? But I think this idea that a movie is either good or bad, and it's a... it's. There's a, no a light in-between. switch, right? That is not a good way for us to tell people how movies are quality-wise. Because it's not that simple, mm-hmm. right? There's just there's so many variables that go in here, right? So if you see a movie that's written well and it's acted really well, but the CGI is crap, well, then what is it? Is it good or is it bad, right? If I say it's good and then you go and you see it and you see CGI that looks like it's from 20 years ago, then you're going to get on me for saying, well, how, how did you, could you thought that CGI was good? Right, so we need a more gray system, and I like IMDb for that. But I think that's what causes this disconnect: is the fans are like, "Well, there's no way it's that bad." So Maybe I don't know. I just think that people want. It's like Marvel versus DC is critics versus fans. Fans, and it's turning into that. You know, DC fans got really defensive because of the low Rotten Tomato score on that movie, Superman, and. Marvel fans, I'm sure, have had similar experiences where it turned out lower. Ant-Man vs. the Wasp, I think you just brought up. And I think that, uh, you know, Venom fans and people that are just comic book movie fans in general are probably just like, guys, you know, don't listen to the critics. This movie's great. Go see it. I had a great time. And maybe they did have a great time, but I think that it's 
really tough to say that that was a that, that was a good movie and Fans know. are also very volatile lately. They want to tank things before they even see it and give it a chance. Like I've seen so many people talking about how terrible uh, Spock is because he just has a beard and they won't uh, even give it a chance to explain themselves why it looks like that. So it's just completely unnecessary garbage that comes out of fans lately. Everybody's a critic. Everybody has their own opinion. And because of the internet, they can't keep it to themselves. So... There is no informed uh, opinions anymore. It's just straight off this picture. I see it. I don't like it. I'm not doing it. Or this is what this guy said about the stuff that I love. Well, screw that guy. I'm going to tank his job and everything else. Like, sorry, you don't get to do that. Just calm down and take the media like everybody else and chill. Like, uh, have an informed opinion. Wait till after. So while, while we've kind of we've taken a bit of a tangent here, maybe this is a good time to address the, a question, a, a topic that's been going around quite a bit. Do you think the movie wasn't great because it lacked Spider-Man? No. No. Although, I, I mean, I think that the character itself just doesn't lend itself well to a solo movie. But I I don't think... I don't know. I do... Th I mean, I'm, now that you actually, I actually think about it, it might have saved the movie, but I... I just don't think the movie should have been made. It should have. If they need Venom, then they should have put Venom in a Spider-Man movie as a villain, and he shouldn't be. I think him as the main character, having Spider-Man as a side character, would not work. That's just mm -hmm. not right. So I think that maybe that's the issue. Is people aren't are, are people saying they want a Venom movie that happens to have Spider-Man in it, or do they just want Spider-Man Spider movie, movie with Venom as a villain? Right. Because those are two different things for sure. I like the idea of having them on equal footing because I love the idea of. Peter Parker and Eddie Brock being professional rivals like they were in the comics. That makes them very interesting to be at uh, odds in their personal and villainous and superhero lives. Like, that to me is a fun dichotomy. So, it, and it would take care of that horrible issue that we brought up earlier where the motivation for Venom changes automatically and... It's a quick light switch. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I think that it could have worked a little bit more as a solo film if if Eddie had more control, right? But from the get-go, as soon as Venom attaches himself to He's Eddie, the one in control. Venom's sure. the one in control. And because of that, you have the bad guy in control. And I think, I think you could have done a darker, maybe borderline horror-esque film where... The good guy is in control, and sometimes he loses control. But the right? Venom, I I think you would have had comic book fans angry at you for that, too, because Venom was a bad guy for the majority of his run, and it's only recently when the whole Agent Venom thing came up, and he's a good guy. Well, that's fine, but the movie ends up with him a good guy anyway. Yeah, right. So you're, you're right. already pissed off that demographic, so you might as well write it well. Right? That's if, fair. If you're going to do it, because I, mean, I, I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like he wasn't necessarily a bad guy, even through a lot of his run. He was more, he was an anti hero, right? Like, he had a vengeance against Spider Man. Right. But I think he, I don't know, it's, to, I, don't, I don't read the comic books. Based on what sure. I've read, he's more of an anti hero than a straight up villain. And even with the Agent, the Agent Venom, he was a good guy. Yeah. Just that wasn't straight really, up good guy. Yeah. But, but uh, and through a lot of his run, he, the reason why he seemed like a bad guy is because he was always trying to kill Spider-Man because the symbiote had a problem with Spider-Man and Eddie Brock had a problem with Spider-Man. So together, they really had a problem with Spider-Man. And that makes mm -hmm. sense. Right. And yeah. so I think if they had played on the anti-hero more and just I, and gone the horror route, I feel like that could have saved the movie. I don't think... I mean, maybe the 30 or 40 minutes could have changed the entire tone. I just don't see a way... Like, all the footage that we saw in the movie... I don't see how any of that could fit into a horror film. No, I, I don't think so either. I think you have to drastically rewrite the movie yeah. to a situation where maybe Eddie is slowly losing control as the movie progresses, right? And there's that horror aspect of him losing himself to this monster that's inside him type of thing. I would have liked it had the mentality gone too. They mentioned very briefly that he was sucking the life straight out of his organs. If the, he was also sucking his uh, sanity too... It would have been very interesting and could have played along the lines of psychological thriller a bit. Now, it does fall into something that we've complained about for 
lots of superhero movies where the villain is basically the same thing as yeah. the hero, mm-hmm. the quote hero, right? Where we have another symbiote who has the exact same powers, he's just better at them, but the underdog is the good guy, so they're going to win. Right. Right. I would have liked it much better if those other two symbiotes, the yellow and the blue one, hadn't died and they had also fought. Yeah. Like, it just would have been cooler to see three symbiotes against Venom. And seeing the other symbiotes, like, it's never going to happen where we get, like, a Scream or a Toxin movie or an anti-Venom movie. But, you know, having them be side characters would have been Fun. And I actually thought the action was another thing that worked in the movie. Like, I agree. You know, the lead up and the drama around the action story, whatever, didn't work. But the actual action looked pretty good, and it was it was kind of cool. The, that I mean, forest scene was fun. Yeah, and just like the general design of, of a symbiote, you know, character, the Venom or the Rage Riot. or Riot. Riot, yeah. Um, you know, weird. coming out to be... Yeah, I didn't look. Cool. <laughs> it, 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 you know, the, the, just the general design of those characters fighting lends itself yeah. to being kind of cool. Although the scene where like they separated for a second was a little weird and i'm kind of like okay guys him. this is cheesy i did like that it, th- th- when riot basically absorbs venom and eddie i thought that was a cool moment mm-hmm. um in an otherwise kind of messy fight scene but the yeah. earlier action sequences like the the, the motorcycle car chase i right. thought was really cool yeah that was fun. and they used the, the symbiote in interesting ways right and... it was unique it was different it wasn't just like two really strong things hitting each other and sometimes they melt right well, so back in february we talked about how the black panther car chase lasted a little bit too long it got to be a little too improbable and we got a little bored with it by the end this one i thought it was probably longer in length but it kept interesting throughout the whole time yeah. i wasn't bored during the car chase at all because stuff was happening mm-hmm. right there's there's that, that character interaction between venom and eddie that you don't get in a normal car chase because nobody's in your head that you're talking to right? right so it made it more interesting there's some character growth and development happening in that scene because eddie has to learn to trust him well and all the so. action scenes have that when you get the first scene in the apartment He's. This is his first time seeing the tendrils and things coming out of him. So I mean, he's fighting it, and you know, uh, you, you see all these things happen that he had has no idea what's going on. So that was character growth too, and I really appreciate that. It, one of my things about movies is if there's a fight scene, then that fight scene should be doing something plot wise. Like it should be mm-hmm. moving the story forward, and you really got to see that in this movie. It was a good example of that. That's I, a really good point. Speaking of the, thank you. Speaking of the uh, <laughs> things that went, would have gone on too long, we talked about Black Panther, but in this case, I think that the time without the Venom symbiote went on too long. I was very yes. bored. You mean the beginning of the movie? Yeah, like I felt like they should have had that happen like right away and just bet him, bet him fighting the symbiote. God, it was at symbiote. least like 30, 45 minutes. It's the whole like first it. act for it, sure. I mean, I almost fell asleep for part of that because I was it was just very boring Tom Hardy was the only thing keeping me going through that cause and he wasn't he... keeping me going so <laughs> well cause like you have the villain okay so Carlton Drake he is so generic stereotypically cliched rich villain he could have been any Bond villain ever written and not the good ones so right? I am <laughs> happy that because it is such a stereotype he was played by a person of color that was That's cool fair. That was the only cool thing and unique thing about him because that easily could have went to White Man number four. We we saw that in Jurassic Park Fallen Kingdom earlier. Rich right. white villain, you know. So at least they're trying to change up the stereotype just a bit. I, that's the only part I can appreciate about Carlton Drake. Otherwise, he sucks. The, the real problem with his character is cliches aside for a moment because I can handle cliche, right? But the switch in motivation from him being one of the most brilliant scientists on the planet to clearly the answer to our survival is to team up with this alien symbiote that destroys us <laughs> is such a leap of logic to me for a character that clearly like had to be level-headed insane and intelligent to get where he he invented spaceships right because like at this in this universe there's elon musk basically but better yeah. because they actually have interstellar travel in this venom universe yeah right so he's created interstellar ships that can go to other asteroids and planets and they find this alien life form and his first thought is let's throw it on some people <laughs> like it, <laughs> it's such a leap for me that at that point i'm like well now i just like now I, you've lost me from now i want you to die this, this leads me to another problem i had with the movie okay 
of the symbiotes themselves and the way they interact with people. Okay. okay. So when Venom attaches to Eddie Brock, the guy's he's achieved full symbiosis. And so yeah. like it's a big thing like this yeah. like this shouldn't have happened. Right. Well then later Venom goes to his girlfriend with no problem. Well, no, no, no. It's a short period of time. Still, the other people died immediately when they were mm-hmm. when they had symbiote. And nobody went off like was able to bring out the full. And venom. nobody was able to like make out with somebody <laughs> while it was going, which was that should never have happened. I don't know what I, that that was weird. So I, I, I that okay. made me feel awkward. So here is the thing: the inconsistent part is the guy who died really quickly because the woman in the beginning of the movie. The riot symbiote that gets loose, right, follows several people all over the world just fine for long hour chunks at a time. But they might have all died at that point. They might have all died at the end, sure. But this dude died in like two minutes, right? right? That's the outlier. Everything else is kind of consistent because Venom just has her for less than an hour. Does that say something about Venom and Riot specifically? Yeah, maybe maybe each one with the way it interacts with the human is different. I mean, I don't know. But they never really explain that. Exactly, they don't say. I think motivation is the key. Riot knew where he needed to go and wanted to keep these hosts alive as long as he could. Venom also didn't want to kill her because he likes her. And he likes Eddie. And he needed to get to Eddie and he needed her to do it. So he's not trying to eat her liver and eat her other organs to survive. He's trying to hold out as long as possible to get back to Eddie. Mm-hmm. Right? So for me that... But then the first one that killed the guy instantly, he didn't want to live? I guess in that case... And then also I mean, uh, that just, yeah. homeless Maria and... Uh, she was surviving. The, the gentleman infected with the yellow one. Yes, both of them were surviving for a period of time. Both of them died yeah. as soon as the symbiote left, left their body. Yeah. And I think that's... We don't know how long they had the symbiotes, those two, right? We really don't know. Could have been 12, 15, 16 hours, which is no, tracks they, with they Riot. had the times on there. Oh, okay. Maria was four days. Oh, okay. The other gentleman with the yellow one was seven. So that, that tracks with Riot's trip around half the world, right? That this, they can survive with someone who's not completely compatible for somewhat of a time. That dude who dies in two minutes, I have no explanation for that. I think that was just convenience of showing the risk at, you know, to the audience. Maybe so. Right? It's just a lot of like weird things that are never explained and we're just supposed to yeah. accept it. No, I mean, so it's, that's, yeah. that, that, that led me back to like the ghost rider and, yeah. the, and the fantastic four. There's obvious plot holes that they just didn't feel the need to address. In this case, you know, it's all supposed to just show us that Eddie and Venom have a special connection, right? right? And clearly nobody else could just step in and take that role. Except they can. Not forever is the idea. Is that, know. That's what we're supposed to believe, is what right. I'm saying. Like, consistency she only had aside. it for an hour or whatever you said, yeah. so maybe you know she could have had it for weeks knows, or months. Right? Yeah. So what else do you guys think did work for the film? Um, I mean... Because we talked, we've talked a lot about things that didn't work. I think it's I don't only think there fair. was much that worked. So the banter worked for me. I liked the banter between Venom and Eddie. I thought so it was the purposeful fun. humor. Yeah, I thought it was fun. I thought it was different. It was a unique character set, right? Because that's not something you have every day. How do you feel about Venom preferring tater tots? I thought that was unnecessary and kind of dumb, personally. But I mean, I did laugh probably. But like looking back on it, I'm going. Arr. I mean, it made sense that they that the symbiotes wouldn't ne- you know need cooked food, mm-hmm. right? Because they're just eating their hosts alive anyway, um, and so that that worked. I like the idea that he was. This is a way to see that he's not himself. He's eating ridiculous stuff, and it makes him really sick because it's not what he's supposed to be. And doing. I'm very happy about that. When he went for that trash chicken, Ugh. and I had to <laughs> prevent myself from vomiting, I'm really glad that he went and vomited right after because you know this parasite in his body is making him just change physically in so many different ways so i'm very happy that there were other repercussions than just him going like super hungry i thought that most of what you, what you're talking about worked i did think the one that they showed in the trailers that was stop showing the end scenes in the trailers Seriously. But, um, but that uh I feel like they just thought it would be funny if Venom said turd. Because that, that whole line does not make any sense. What does a turd do in the wind? I don't, it doesn't roll down the street. I can tell you that much. It's because they probably had some more vulgar line in the R-rated version, right? And they didn't know what to replace it with. 
Maybe so, but it just didn't make happen. any sense. And I feel like we're supposed to laugh at the fact that Venom knows the word turd. No. Yeah, honestly, that but, was but horrible. before that scene actually happened, I'm like, oh, I guess that just didn't make it into the cut. Is what I assume. Yeah, it's so I think didn't Avengers Infinity War do that, where there's a scene that was released, like, or well, that was something shown in the trailer that's like from the very end where Spidey died, right before Spidey dies. They yeah. showed that in the trailer. They showed the sad Tony. Right. But, I mean, Avengers, Infinity War is this a little was a bit full different. This scene, though. Yeah. Inf- yeah. Infinity War is a little different because they had to hide stuff because they didn't want to spoil things. Right? So you have you ha- you have Tony being sad, but you really don't know why. And the reason he's sad is very different than probably what you thought. Right. Right? You show Hulk as part of the group running because you don't want to tell everybody that he's not really going to be in it. Right? But for Venom, like, what's the point in throwing that scene at the end of the movie? Like, it just seems so tacked on. Well, it's to show that yeah. he's now a anti-hero. And that he talks about turds. It, <laughs> it does really seem like they didn't have a way to end the film. So that is what they came up with. Because I truly believe that that scene was originally supposed to be much earlier in the film. Well, they That's... wanted to follow. I mean, they, they had set up that scene earlier. Sure. Mm-hmm. And so they needed to pay off on that. But I think that that was a weird choice of placement for it, it to too pay late. off. Oh, yeah. 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 It was way too late. Um, so here's a question for you. Because I don't read marvel comics the, the the two big weaknesses that the symbiotes all have which is fire okay and the the sound waves that right. particular hurts is that a comic book weakness? so the fire thing is something that like i don't know it makes total sense that this squid thing doesn't want fire around him. the sound thing they had in spider-man 3 yeah. venom hated and that was in the comic books too yeah that's the, so okay. i at don't least remember that's been consistent over Spider-Man all the venom 3, so because i refuse to rewatch it that's fine yeah, it's totally it. fine like he I'm sorry <laughs> sandman was worth it he gets sorry. Venom out of Eddie Brock by uh, yeah, surrounding him with all those pipes bars. and right. like hitting them and I remember that now. It, it was completely like bells and metal sounds as opposed to the high hertz frequency. So then in that case, Venom did it better. That's what I had three did. Well, they had used the sound waves thing really. Yeah, uh, they tried to stay away from that because of Spider Man. Probably, 3, yeah. Which I think worked. Yeah. I, I Venom mean, did a lot better than what Spider-Man Three did with Eddie Brock. But first of all, the casting. Not Topher Grace, yeah. Topher Grace is. Eric Foreman should not be. I mean, let's just Venom. look at where Topher Grace is now. The last role he played was the Ku Klux Klan leader, David uh, David Duke, and Black Klansman. So let's just drop Topher Grace from our radar ever, because if that's the only role he can get, he's not worth our well, conversation. Well, it's a Spike Lee film, though. It's a little different. Do you really think yeah. David Duke's that important in a Spike Lee film? Like, I'm pretty sure everybody opposing David Duke's more important in a Spike Lee film. <laughs> no, but I mean, I imagine if you're a white actor and Spike Lee asks you to be in his movie, you probably say yes. Which is why Adam Driver did as one of the good guys. <laughs> well, I'm, just, I'm just saying, you know, yeah, get work. I don't know his, I don't, I haven't followed Topher Grace. I, you know, I've never really right. followed him so i don't know what else he's been doing That's um, all I meant, so. so let's talk about that mid credit scene where uh reporter eddie brock goes to meet serial killer ronald mcdonald yeah <laughs> well i mean so there were rumors before the movie came out that woody harrelson was playing carnage yes and we didn't see that the whole movie so it's like okay i guess he's not um but then he shows up. And I think his name was actually in the credits before that mid-credit as scene. As Yeah, and I was like, okay, that's a, that's a little weird. I assumed it had been cut, but there was something in his contract about him getting credit for work he shot. Right. Well, I don't so, think he... I'm not saying he shouldn't have gotten credit, but I feel no, like yeah. that scene should have come before the credit, because that kind of... If you know what you're looking for, that gives away what the credit scene is right there. I actually think that's how they should have ended it, instead of that stupid conversation. Like, that could have been your final scene. Yeah, I don't know why that needed to be a post-credit scene, yeah, necessarily. It... Okay, yeah, so I guess we, we should talk about that. So, yeah. I, I think I've said it on the podcast before, but I'm not a fan of Carnage being in a movie. Period. Just in general. His character does not let itself to a movie. He's not interesting in the way that a villain on film should be. He literally is just a psychopath that walks around and kills people. And there's no motivation behind it. He's just He's a crazy person murdering people with a, a symbiote. child molester, a rapist, a murderer. There's nothing redeemable about there's Carnage. There's nothing relatable. There's literally no. nothing that any normal person can relate to about the character. And I think people think his character looks cool in the comic books. 
and that's why they want him to be on screen. But that doesn't make a good villain. No, but that's the problem when you're trying to make a movie versus a comic book is now you have the mass audiences. And what do people who don't read comics know about Spider-Man and Venom? They Carnage. Know, they know Carnage. They team up for the first time when yeah. they face Carnage. No. Nobody knows Riot. Yeah. You know, unless you read the comics. Right. You know, right? And you don't know, you know, these all these other symbiotes don't mean anything to the non-comic fan. You you know Venom and you know Carnage. My issue is now the origin of Carnage is going to be incredibly weird because in the comics, Eddie Brock and Cletus Cassidy are cellmates and Eddie Brock escapes because of Venom because he's in there, but he leaves just a little bit of Venom behind. That doesn't work for this character. He brings all of him with him. There's no, like, melting and leaving yeah. pieces behind. So then the only option is a new symbiote has to come from space and attach to this asshole. And, like, they, should have they at least just stopped that. They should have symbiote to, you know, Absolutely. at least set it up. They well, could have escaped or something. That's the, how hard would it have been for there to have been a fifth one and be like, oh, yeah, we never found it. They didn't even need the, the yellow or the blue. It could, One yeah. could have been red. And it could have had such a ridiculous effect on these people. Instead of just, like, eating their livers or something, like, they could have burned out in seconds. Or, you know, it, it could have changed their entire personalities immediately. Like, they could have showed that Carnage was, or the Red Symbiote was very violent and excessive. So, but they didn't. They they have screwed themselves out of a good origin story, so I I'm with Ryan. I think it's gonna be crap. It could maybe. Well, there is always a possibility that it's not an origin story. That he already is infected with a symbiote. Why is he staying in jail then? We. Why did he want to see Eddie Brock? That's that, a, that, that was a plot issue for me too you know, because he just because Eddie Brock is this hard hitting reporter. Like, now he wants <laughs> to go visit a serial mm-hmm. killer. Like, if they write Colin that in the next movie and make it so that it's because he's already a symbiote and, you know, was that just wanting to meet another symbiote. be the okay. only reason why he says that stupid word, carnage. I hate when people say the thing. I hate Say their it. name, yeah. I hate it. Don't yeah, say the thing. Said his Peter name Griffin, he said the thing, he yeah. said the thing. <laughs> That's how I yeah. feel. He said the thing. Like, I hate that. So, so I couldn't decide whether I loved or hated the prosthetics and wig for Carnage. Because, I mean, he is a ridiculous looking character hair. in the comic book. <laughs> Stop it. In the comic books, he does look ridiculous. He has a weird fit- shaped yeah. face. He has, like, crazy red hair. He, they want you to know he's a crazy person. I didn't notice prosthetics. We've he had, like, a weird chin prosthetic. I'm pretty okay. sure, yeah. They made him more gaunt. Weird. Like, he yeah. had been sitting in prison for years. See, I thought it made it look like it was, like... More squared wedged off? Wedged or... out, like, reversed. I, I need to see it again, because it oh, was really God, bothering me, to. the shape of his face. I'll watch it on YouTube or something when the movie releases. But why? Like, Woody Harrelson has played Intimidating before, and if you don't believe me, go watch Natural Born Killers right now. He is already... Or why they can, can't jump. Right. I mean, he can bring out the scary if he wants to bring out the scary. He's a great, she went right with it. I did, he, yeah. He is a great villain in War for the Planet of the Apes. Yeah. You know, he's he, a good actor. That's not the problem. You can bring out... <laughs> it's a weird setup. It yeah. was. What was he writing on the wall in blood? Hi, what, Eddie, or yeah, something? Yeah, welcome, Eddie, or, yeah. You know. That's what makes me think maybe Carnage is already there. and He's they, not just a psychopath? That's he's not, the only acceptable thing, and it's still lazy plot. I mean, maybe, you know? I, part of me is thinking, you know, maybe somehow he found out about the space crash, and so he just wanted to bide his time until he could get in contact with these other symbiotes, you know, type of thing. I, I don't know. That seems like a lot of stretching. Am I giving him too much credit, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. I think but... you're taking a really long walk a long for walk. something that is not going to make sense. I mean, I guess they could retcon it to make it make sense, but right now, as of now, I don't think anything that happened in that <laughs> mid-credit scene makes any sense. That's fair. I guess for it me... It was just a setup for the second movie yeah, if you go that route. it's clearly all that it is. All right, so... There's the final post-credit scene, now, which had nothing to do with the movie. I don't think we should really spend a lot of time talking about it. It was a scene straight out of... a promotion for... Into the Spider-Verse. The new Spider-Man movie, yeah. We're all three really hyped for that. It looks like a really that scene fun did, movie. I'm going to and be honest, that scene did hype me up more. Yeah. I thought it was really good, although I kind of hate seeing a full scene before a movie releases, because then too. when that, movie, that scene comes on, or when you're watching the movie, you're like... Okay, when's this scene happening? You know, and then you're like, I've already seen. That's this. why I'm not too happy with the extended Aquaman trailer. That whole scene Five in minutes, the Sahara uh, and a piss joke. Yeah, come on. How many yeah. do we need a piss joke in every DC movie now? Is that what right. it's gonna be? Um, I didn't even think about that connection. Actually, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Did I just do that to you? No, I just every I single one. It. Um, but uh, no, because 
sometimes movies will have done this, but it's the be- literally the beginning of the film. Like when Tron Legacy came out, they did a special 15-minute preview. Well, it was the first 15 minutes. Doctor Strange that too. did too. We saw right. that. Exactly. And that's, that's a different. little different. Well, right, because it's not just some scene later in the movie where you're trying to guess when it's happening. It's just you're getting it out of the way. We just want to show you the beginning. They did of the that movie. for The Dark Knight too, if I remember right. When that came out, they released the whole like bank heist oh, scene. Oh, right. Ahead of time. But yeah. that's different because we all went into it knowing that it was a chunk of the movie. We had no clue what that final scene yeah. was, so right. we were kind of duped into it a bit. It was weird to have a post credit scene for a different... A promo- as a promotion for right. a completely different, unrelated movie. And it does kind of piss me off that fans were like, Spider-Man's really in it. He, guys, come on. Yeah. Come we on. all knew he wasn't going to be come in Come on. It. Oh, they saw him on set? Yeah, okay, I'm sure they did. Sure. Whatever. <laughs> I completely believe that Tom Holland has been to San Francisco where they shot... Anyway, let's do our letter grades. Ryan? 73.5%, somewhere between a C and a so C minus. C. Okay. Wow. Derek? Okay. I was going to go with a C. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's where I'm at. It's fun. It's certainly not, you know, offensive to me in any way as a movie. I wasn't mad about any of it. I, it's fine. You know, it was, I actually expect, maybe it's because my expectations were so low, I expected this to be a dumpster fire, and it wasn't. That's true. So I think we all predicted it to be, mm-hmm. like, in our bottoms when we did the the prediction for what movies were going to be popular this I year. I gotta listen to that episode again Yeah, soon. I think we all picked it to be a flop. I mean, it helps that there, there wasn't a lot of competition this month in October, right? I mean, A Star is Born is a very different kind of movie. Yeah. Right? Smallfoot, of course, is a very different kind of movie. So, the, you know, if you wanted to see a big blockbuster film. I think that's film, why all three did really well this weekend, because three completely different audiences went to go see them. So there's no reason why any fans stole fans from somebody else. Please. yeah. But yeah, it's a good C movie. I will probably purchase it and watch it when I need a good laugh, because it did. It made me laugh, and it's probably going to make me laugh, and I don't care if that because the joke was on purpose or the bad writing made me giddy. Now, if you want to sell this Blu-ray, you add a commentary track that's Eddie and Venom. Oh, yeah, that. That's that would what you be do. fun. Then you definitely get people to buy that movie. That would be I fun. would rewatch that movie just to listen to that commentary track. Side note, I think this is the closest all three of us have ever been on a score or on a letter Probably. Rate for a movie. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Which is funny. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of arguing here. We mostly agreed with each other. Yeah. Okay, guys, we answer your questions. We didn't slam the villain as much as I wanted to, but... Answer... <laughs> Riot was awful. Thank yeah. you. Slam. Answer your questions. Who's your bestie? Ryan? There was only one left at the end, so it's kind of by default. Uh, my bestie had to be Harley, which if, you, if okay. you listen to this, you know that I'm not a big Harley fan, so that kind of hurts my soul a little bit. And if I have to pick the Harley, I want the Harley after she left Joker and just kind sure. of became friendly with... Uh, with uh, Black Canary and some of the others. Um, okay. And she's much less annoying at that point. So Good call. Who's uh, your bestie? I picked Harley, too. Okay. I think she'd just be fun to hang out with, you know. Okay. She's nuts, but... Ryan, who's your wifey? Um, Catwoman. Nice. Because I don't really want a psycho <laughs> for, my, for my wife, and I don't really want <laughs> Poison Ivy, because she's a little more too risque for my taste, I think, in okay. general. And... Derek? And that's why Ivy's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I, yeah, I mean, well, because think about it, because then it leaves your partner in crime, and Catwoman would be my partner in crime. She's literally a cat burglar. That's what right. she does. But okay. Poison Ivy is my partner in crime because she's the only super-powered one and can do all kinds of crazy yeah, shit. She's really good literally the most powerful this. of any of the We're three. not arguing. This is your own personal pick. It's not a fight, guys. Right, right, right. like, it I... is a fight because I picked the most powerful one to be my partner in crime because <laughs> how, I'm doing crime. How dare you, sir? Yeah, not world-ending plans. Maybe apocalypse. that's the kind of crime I want to do. Well, then we have a problem, sir. No, we don't. <laughs> Swamp Thing would be so disappointed in No, he wouldn't. He loves Poison yeah, Ivy. Yeah, they, they are really good well. friends. All right, guys. That wraps us up for this episode. Let us know what you thought of Venom in the comics. Kind of- in the comics. In the comments. Or also in the comics. In the comics, yeah. Like the Are comics, you a Venom comics, comics, comics fan? Tell us. Well, Let well, us well, know. Well. Um, okay. Feel free to hit us up at Heroes Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can contact us at any time. Also, check out our Patreon. If you, you are... give us money. If you are a patron, you get direct access to us all day long through our Slack channel, 
That you is. You may get someone to respond even, which hey, you don't know. We you do. would be one step ahead of Derek if Look, you could do that. It's been a little quiet in there, you know. So the more people we get in there, the more conversation we can have. It doesn't have to have anything to do with our podcast. No, we talk a lot about pop culture, so join in on some of the conversations. Uh, my masculine and handsome hosts, where can they find you guys? Well, first off, I just wanted to plug our topic next week in case anyone needed to prepare for it. Oh. So I wasn't going to do that yet, but oh, okay. You're going to do that at the end? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then I am the Star Trek Dude on Twitter, and I also host Red Shirts and Runabouts, our Star Trek podcast. So you can go check that out. Absolutely fabulous. Ryan. <laughs> at Buster Props. I don't uh, host anything other than this, and I barely host this. <laughs> so thank you for making me feel inadequate, Derek. You're welcome. <laughs> I am at Siren Ray on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, so you can hit me up there. Next week, join us for another episode of Screen Heroes Live on Twitch. Uh, we are talking Cable Guy. This is Ryan's pick for our Fill Our Holes uh, segment, and Derek is the only one who hasn't seen it. I haven't seen it in a good like, 10, 15 years. I so. watch it like twice a year, so... <laughs> This, this should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to re-watching this. Uh, yeah, watch it. Join us next week. We'll see you then. Bye.